Singer-songwriter Henry Gross was the youngest player at Woodstock in 1969, and he saw a performer that changed his life, Jimi Hendrix. It's more or less a 1964 Ed Sullivan Beatles story. Everyone has those, the Beatles being probably, of course, the biggest one. My life changed when I saw them on that program. Well, for Henry Gross and probably hundreds or thousands of others, their trajectory probably changed when they saw, if they were lucky enough, Jimi Hendrix said Woodstock. He was inspired to leave the band that got him to Woodstock. Here's Henry Gross. Yeah, why did you leave Shannon? A lot of reasons. I mean, but I mean, there were many reasons for it. Um, but I'll, I'll say the, the one that's most obvious to me in retrospect was watching Jimi Hendrix play the Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock from 20 feet away and thinking, this guy is making music only he can make. I got to make music only I can make if such a thing is possible. And I've been chasing that dragon all these years. You were the youngest guy on the main stage, right? Yeah, I was 18. So I was 18 when this epiphany, and it was eight in the morning. So maybe that was my breakfast at epiphanies. But um, just quite possibly that was it. But, uh, (laughs) you know, and so it was a big epiphany. And it was and it was a very funny story attached to it because when I when we started the band, I told my dad I was wanted he wanted me to be pre-med and I was taking those courses at Brooklyn College. It was in my first semester. And then with some friends of mine from Columbia University, this band started happening and and we got very successful very quickly. You now when I said I was gonna start a band, my father said, if I may quote, don't be a schmuck, you're throwing your life away. And I said, uh, you know, I'm going to do it. So I did it. And then the band's successful. And now, the, you know, I've had this epiphany and I've watched this and it's been, you know, I wanted to make my own music and I, I believed like an idiot it was possible. And if you're an idiot and you run off the cliff like the roadrunner, you don't fall till when? Till you look down. Well, don't look down and you won't fall. So I didn't look down and I didn't fall. I mean, at times I did. Maybe you could say overall I did. People don't know me that well, but I didn't. Life's been great. I'm still ma- I'm doing I'm, I'm I'm playing the game harder than people that sold billions of records. So my god, you you made this. That's all well, I can say. Man to man, so, you made well, this. Like but wow. We're the only few guys that know about it. You know, and you well, it's my you. job to change that a little bit. Well, so. you know, but and I appreciate it, but so anyway, where where we were before that cuz I get it. oh so so anyway, I announced a, a couple of months after the Woodstock thing, you know, we're getting really big. Shana and I was really blowing up. And I tell my father, I'm leaving the band because I want to do my own music. And he says, don't be a schmuck. <laughs> so there's no way to win with your dad. You know, <laughs> what about when Shannon happened? What, what the, was, was he around? Oh yeah. That was the proudest moment of my life. You know, that I didn't make change my name to rock, you know, to rock God, you know, <laughs> whatever people change their names to. You know, I left my dad's name on it. And when Shannon was a hit, you know, I gave him the dog because we were on the road all the time. So he had the iron and he'd walk down the street and a little army of little kids would run around petting the dog. Is that Shannon? He was, proud, you know, because my dad saw the world in terms of the mucky mucks who we would now refer to as the elites and, our, and, and ourselves. You know, we were like we were in the loser's locker room. And if not in the loser's locker room, we were once, you know, we had... We had our own locker in the loser's locker room. What did your dad do? What did your dad do? He was a pharmacist. Oh, which right, meant, right. Which meant he worked seven days a week from, from nine in the morning till usually 10 o'clock at night and standing on his feet till he had to wear bandages around his legs because his veins were popping. You know, it's a, it's a tough job. And, and, you know, there was the, it was a very tough job. It was a little drugstore and not everyone behaved like a gentleman that came in. Mm-hmm. There were robberies. There were, you know, there was all up to grand theft, larceny, and everything beneath, you know. And, and we were lucky there wasn't murder of one of us in there or by one of us. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. you know what? I, I, uh, um, before we get going, let me just say, I don't know, I don't know what it is. I don't know what you're doing. I'm like, I'm like Michael. <laughs> I'm like, uh, what's his name? Jack Nicholson telling Batman, where do you get all these things in your belt? Uh, how do you do it? Like, that's like, this is an amazing, it's even better than the last one. It is, isn't it? 
it's I didn't think this is well, when we start. I'll tell you, it's an interesting thing. I thought after the last one, honestly, that I was done. I thought, okay, you know, I don't can't sell a lot of these records because they just can't. The people don't have CD players. They tell me, I, t- I ask my friends, you want me to send you a CD? And they go, nah, I'm going to download it because I, I don't have a player in my car. And the CD sounds so great. We mastered it. To, we, we, I mean, most people, they go to a mastering lab. They, we did it ourselves, and John McLean and I, and we, we went through each song. We must have done some of them a dozen times till we thought they punched. And But the thing that happened was... Um, the last album I really was proud of, and I thought when I ended on, um, you know, uh, the last apology, I thought, "Wow, I'm never going to top that." I thought I can't top that. And so what happened was, I got a call from Lansky's. This is how it really started. Lansky's in Memphis. Bernard Lansky made a Lansky Brothers made all the clothes for Elvis Presley. So if you're an Elvis freak, you know Lansky's on Beale Street, and they're in the Peabody Hotel in Memphis. So I knew I met Hal Lansky and got friendly with him. And his daughter called me and asked me, she said everybody was doing, everybody, all the artists they knew, which is to say everyone, was doing a promo for Lansky. She said, just go on your iPhone and make a commercial, you know, like just say something nice about Lansky's and we're going to make a collage of these things. And so I thought, nah. So I went and made, I wrote a song about Lansky's and uh, I wrote a song about it and um, I thought, well, okay, that's cool. And then we made a video and we made this fabulous John McClane and I made this, John really made it, but we filmed this fabulous video and sent it to them. And everybody went nuts over this commercial. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll write a song. <laughs> and it's, I thought, maybe I'm not done. Maybe I'll so, write 20 but, songs. Oh, I got so, you. Yeah. Started. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, one of them was a redo. Big Guitar was actually a hit for Blackhawk, the country band. Henry Paul and I wrote it. And uh, they had a pretty big hit on it. Uh, on, on their second album but um it just kept we, we started cutting and it just had a life of its own it really you know when you say when i talked about shannon and i said i didn't write it i wrote it down you know it's just sometimes it's passing through you the pen's moving and you don't even know what you're writing and you look at it and you go wow did i write that Have somebody up there likes me as paul newman said you know <laughs> i mean it's really so this kept happening and as I was doing it, I have a friend, uh, I work with two people really, really John McClain and I make these records. And there's a guy called Lee Brovitz, who's a great bass player, has played with everyone from Tommy Rowe to Cindy Lauper and you name it, he's, he's, he's great. And he's sort of like my consigliere. He comes over and he goes, are you kidding? That's, too, that's, that's a beat too slow. And or he'll say to me, he'll listen to the mix and he'll say to me, you know, that's a that's he said, when did you guys think you were going to do a shuffle with no hi hat in the mix? You know, because it's just, you know, we hear what we focus on and he comes in and he doesn't know what we're doing. And he goes, hey, it's a nice picture, but the guy's got no head. <laughs> so so it was really incredible. So it's just everybody's timing. And of course, with the covid thing, there was nothing to do but sit at the kitchen table and write songs. So that's what I did. So we'd go in and I, I we'd start one, it, you know, it'd take a couple of sessions. I would get one session a week. And I'm a complete germaphobe, as is John McClank. We're complete germaphobes. And so is Lee. So nobody talked to anybody, you know, and I would see John and, you know, it, it was almost like, do you remember in Dr. No, when they have to get sprayed down to go into the, you know, into the, the, the island thing there. Well, that's what was kind of happening with John. You know, it's like he'd say, hello, are you okay? <laughs> From across the street, you know, so we got through it and it was song after song just kept piling up. And then there was one song that, um, with your love and on my mind, which, you know, well, anyway, that, that I had had around for about 20, 20 years, or 15 years. And it just never felt like it belonged, but this album went everywhere. So, you know, between this album and the last album, I don't, the only thing I could do, what could I do after that? Tecano music? I don't know what else I didn't touch, which maybe I'll do it. But, you know, I, I really had fun. So that, that's how this came about. There's not an, there's not even an average song on here. Like my, my, my son, Chase, was sleeping and, and uh, that's his bedroom. And my studio where I record my radio shows behind, right behind a small little yoga room. And it's perfect for me. And I kept going, holy, what the? 
you know, like uh, over and over again, like instrumentation is unbelievable. Little mandolin there, little banjo there, like fun songs. A uh, lot. Of, I, I wasn't expecting to see a lady there because I'm going, he must be single because he's writing some hurting songs. But I know writers write hurting songs and that's what happens. You, you know, my wife is lenient in that I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to dream. <laughs> in my own sweet time is the brand new album from Henry Gross. An album I simply loved. We'll have a track by track on her sister channel in the next few weeks. Henry Gross was Sean Anna's original lead guitarist. And he was with them from 69 to 70. Jimi Hendrix's performance changed everything. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music. Take care.